Uh, so hey everyone, so today what I want to be talking about is this paper called uh, SimClear. So it's a simple framework for contrastive learning of visual representations. Um, so what does this mean exactly? And so uh, I'm going to be explaining the, the paper and sort of give you some uh, good background for how to understand it. Uh, but the main idea is that, okay, well, you know, we have this thing called, this word called contrastive self-supervised learning without requiring memory bank. Okay, so that's one aspect to it. Then they talk about how we have a composition of data augmentations. We have a nonlinear transform between representations and the loss. And that contrastive learning benefits from large batch sizes and more training. Okay, and so we combine these findings and they find that the linear classifier trained on self-supervised representation learned by SimClear achieves 76.5 top one accuracy, which is a 7% relative improvement over precious previous state-of-the-art algorithms. Matching the performance of supervised ResNet 50 when fine-tuned on only 1%, they achieve even, even better. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, you know, like there's a lot, lots of words, uh, but let's like sort of disambiguate some of them. So imagine like, you know, like I've talked about birth a billion times already, but just because it provides like a good analogy for self-supervised learning. So in BERT, like, let's say, you know, the, let's say you have the sentence, I am Mark. Uh, and then, so then given, uh, you know, let's assume that you mask this word out. You're, you're trying to guess like, well, what is the, sorry, no, let's do the other. Yeah, so let's say this word is masked. So given I and Mark predict uh, M, right? So this is not supervised exactly because there's no human labels. It's called self-supervised uh, because like the labels are generated from the data, right? So you, you know what the correct word is. It's M based on the data set. And so you're just like trying to figure out like uh, what that word should be. So contrastive learning is a, is a similar idea. So what we're gonna do is, uh, you know, let's assume we have a bunch of images, right? So images sort of look like this, like this is like, let's assume some grayscale images. And we want to learn to classify these. <laughs> but the issue here is that normally, you know, we would not just have an image, we would have like an image and a label. So here we don't have a label, we just have an image. So, uh, so we can sort of turn this into a self-supervised learning problem like in the following way. Like let's assume that you have two images Say this is, uh, yeah, so this is image one, uh, and then this is image two. So image one. And the question we're gonna ask ourselves, is image one the same as image two, right? So why does this become supervised all of a sudden? Well, well, you know what the label is, right? Like, is it are are they equivalent to each other? So, how do we actually learn something like this? Like, this is sort of like the core problem. So, the way we're gonna do this is that you know you can imagine you have some some image, like I said before. So, let's say this is image one, and then this is image two. We're gonna learn some sort of compressed representation for this image. So, let's call this uh, rep one and then this is rep two and then we're going to ask basically are these two things the same or not so this starts to look a lot like uh you know like like if you've seen typically in auto encoders you'll have this structure where you're trying to learn an, uh, an input from itself um so the way this will this will generally be done is you'll have like let's say some sort of layer one and then a smaller layer two Eventually you get to a pretty small layer three, for example, and then you make it bigger again, layer four, uh, layer five. And the way you would learn all of these weights is like, well, you want layer five to output the same thing uh, as uh, layer one input, layer five output, yeah. Let me just zoom out here so you can see what's going on. <clears throat> so this is sort of like the, the, the core problem. Okay, so let's just go over uh, like so, some more pictures of how this works. So there's this uh, tutorial I really like by uh, Ahmed Shadari that goes over how this works exactly. Um, 
And basically here, like we're saying, okay, well, like, yeah, so this is the picture I had earlier, which is essentially we're not trying to make a prediction as to what kind of class, like, is this a dog or a cat? We're just saying, are these both a picture of the same thing? That's like, a, like an easier problem because you don't need labels for, for this, uh, for this sub problem. <clears throat> right? And so we're thinking, okay, great. Um, one way to, to figure out um, here. So like, let's say we had two images of a cat, right? We had cat one and then uh, cat two. Sorry, like cat one again. Like this is the exact same image. So we're gonna do the same thing. Like we're gonna pass this in through like a bunch of encoders and then we're gonna ask, is it the same? And then we're gonna get uh, like a value of yes or no. <clears throat> but the thing is, it almost always also feels like, well, let's say this is not the same image. Let's say these are different images. So the only way we can actually figure out whether there's the same or not is we again need to have labels. And so instead of having, like, let's say our uh, labels look like, let's say image one class, it would look like uh, image two, image one, image two, and then a class, right? So it's still a supervised learning problem um, and we need a lot of data for this. So what's one way to sort of trick this and, and basically artificially get more data? So the, the main trick lies in like data augmentation. So for example, like uh, let's say you have an image, right? And typically, you know, let's say this is a 4K image. So let's say you have, uh, like let's assume this is like a million pixels by a million pixels. It's like an absolutely gigantic image. So one very common thing that you've probably have already done is like, let's say image resizing. So you've resized this to 256 times uh, 256. Uh, and then another thing you could have done was like, let's say uh, increase uh, the contrast. And then another thing you could have done is, uh, I don't know, like redden the reds, redden reds more. Uh, another thing you could do is like rotate the images, right? And so this is where we get to uh, some of like, like this is all like these are all examples of data pre-processing techniques for images. And the reasoning is that like let's say our original data set, let's say we have a million uh, images in our data set. If you do these pre-processing techniques, well, like given a million images, you can get just like as many you want. You can get like a billion images after pre-processing. And the reason this is important is because generally models do better with more data. Obviously they do better with more diverse data, but this is just like a like an easy way to artificially increase the, 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 data, the amount of data you have in your model. And so as you may have guessed, uh, what, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say, okay, well, we have image one, right? And then we're gonna have image one plus process, some like processing, right? And then we're gonna ask, are these the same? Right? And so this gives us an easy way to generate like as much data as we want from a limited set of images by using the same kinds of tricks that we've used to generalize neural networks. Here instead we're using this trick to basically uh, have a supervision signal that works and have enough data for doing self-supervised uh, image learning. So the reason this is called, uh, so, so back to the name, right? So this is called simple contrastive learning, right? So learning, well, this is just machine learning. Simple, we'll, we'll get to this in a second, like why they call it simple in the, in the core paper. But contrastive basically means uh, comparing two things. So again, like we're not learning how to classify things. We're, we're learning to figure out if two things are the same. So th there's a, this is an important problem. Like let's say uh, in the most abstract sense, like the graph isomorphism problem, for example, like two graphs, are they the same? Uh, is one example uh, of, of this sort of approach. Like, is there a sort of a natural symmetry in this problem where these things are the same? Like, because really these images are invariant to permutation. Like if I take a picture of a dog with one kind of camera lens and then with another lens, it's still a dog. Right, so if you if you take that intuition further, things don't change depend depending on how you observe them, and that's why this approach uh, is is fairly is, is fairly good. Um, and so, okay, great. So so you know, so far the same part. I've been treating it like a black box, but you know, one way to do it is that well, if you have an image, so let's say you have a two D image, 
right? And then this is an n by n image. So one, one thing you could do is, for example, you could just like flatten this matrix, right? So you could just like literally take all of the, the rows and append them to each other. Uh, and then you can end up with a representation that looks something like this, right? So you're going to have an n by n, uh, an n by n image. Uh, as a, as a uh, sorry, n by n vector. So really, what we're actually going to do is not n by n. We're going to do maybe like a k-sized vector because we want this. We want it to learn a representation, not like just a hash. So we want this to be smaller. Um, and so okay, great. So now you have the. So we're going to do this for each image. So we're going to have like let's say image one and image two. This is image one. This is image two. So this is image one. This is image two. We're going to turn this into a vector. We're going to turn this into a vector. And then we're going to check, are these two vectors the same using cosine similarity? So just in case you've forgotten, like this is what cosine similarity looks like. All right, so this is just the equation. So it's just like a, it's just a simple formula that gives you uh, a sense of how like how different two vectors are and so the values here are going to range from minus one to one minus one means they're exactly opposite one means they're perfectly aligned and zero means that they're just like orthogonal like there's absolutely no correlation between them uh, so ideally like our loss is going to be making sure that the similarity is as close to one as possible right so you're gonna like back to just turning this into a machine learning problem right like you're gonna have a, a loss which is going to take, uh, let's say, uh, some hash of image one and some hash of image two, right? And so this is going to basically output uh, cosine similarity minus the target, right? So let's see, does this work? So if they're the same, it's one. So maybe the, the sigmoid of the cosine similarity or something, yeah. So something like the equals the sigmoid of cosine similarity and the targets, right? So so why am I doing the, the sigmoid? Well, because like I want the values to be between uh, zero and one and cosine similarity goes from minus one to one. So this is a very simple way to do it, but I think I, I probably in the paper, they do something a bit different. And then your actual target is going to be uh, one if they're the same and zero if they're not the same. So we're going to have like, again, some function of, of these things. And so this looks very similar to just like traditional logistic regression, for example. Um, and this is pretty much like how, how this is sort of going to work. And so now I want to just keep going through these examples, maybe show you a couple more pictures, and then we can actually go through the paper and the code. So here, for example, like we talked about this, right? So you have this, this image. And you're going to do some data augmentation on it. So let's say now you have two different variants of, variants of the same image. You encode it, so you make it go through, uh, like, but you basically find a hash for the for it. And then project it means that like you're essentially now deciding, well, I, I have this representation, and I want to turn this representation into a vector of fixed length. And once it's a vector of this of fixed length, you want to say, well, I want to now maximize the similarity of these two things. Uh, and what we're going to also do is that this intermediate representation here, like before we actually flatten these things, like we're going to end up using for some downstream tasks. So downstream tasks like also have a label. So like, let's say this is could be something like a class, actual classification. So what you could do is then add this part as like an embedding. So like given a new image, you hash it. And so it becomes very similar to the way you use embeddings in text, for example. So these, these are, think of these as like image embeddings. Right, so they also talk quite a bit about the kinds of pre-processing they can do. So for example, one is cropping the image, right? Another one could be flipping it, uh, color jittering it, which means like randomizing the colors, uh, grayscaling it, so giving it like uh, just like turning all the like basically taking three channels and flattening them to, to a single channel by taking the average. Um, and so here, like you'll see that like like really the point is as like let's say you have like a batch size of two here, for example, so you have two images. Well, each element in the batch is going to translate into its own pair. And then for each pair, your loss is on a pair on a pairwise level summed over all the examples. 
So each, exa again, each example generates a pair, and you're going to take the loss over all the pairs to get the loss for the whole network. All right? So the interesting thing is that, like, here when they just use an encoder, like, they didn't use anything really uh, special. They used ResNet50, which is uh, sort of the classic uh, image algorithm. I talk quite a bit about ResNet in my one of my UNet tutorials, but really the main ideas in ResNet are CNNs, uh, like, a con uh, like a normalization, uh, and then a ReLU. So this is sort of the same, like these same components, you take them, you apply them, and then you can come up with the representation as long as you don't flatten and then take a softmax across this vector. You can, you're gonna have a vector of fixed length that you determine based on the size of the last layer. You take the size of that layer instead to be an intermediate representation. And then once, once given that intermediate representation, you can learn another network, which then only learns to maximize the similarity between two networks by maximizing the cosine similarity. So that's what the projection head business is all about. And you also notice like it's just a dense ReLU dense. So again, instead of being like, and, but you know, this could also have plausibly been like a con of dense, uh, sorry, a conv ReLU conv, instead it's a dense. And this, this works because a conv really is a, a generalization of uh, a matrix multiplication. So this is sort of like, again, this is a formula for cosine similarity. And this sort of exists like by default and stuff like NumPy and stuff. Uh, and then the way they end up taking the loss here is they use this loss called the NT normalized scaled cross entropy loss. And so, okay, so let's say we take two pairs of images, right? So now we have these images and, oh, interesting. So we're, we're gonna take the pair, like, like we're gonna take the, Again, like remember, we're, we're doing a problem over pairs, right? Like we're not doing a problem over single single examples. So we're gonna take a softmax that gives us a probability that this pair, that the current pair that we're looking at is the correct one, divided by all the other pairwise probabilities in the batch. So this is sort of like why you do it. And it's also why I would imagine that they say in the paper that larger batch sizes help uh, because you just get a more precise normalization factor and then you get a more precise expression for your softmax. The flip side of that is that it takes a lot more time to compute this for larger batch sizes. So yeah, so this is how it looks. This is like a more uh, technical formulation for it, but it's sort of just the idea is really what I explained. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that like the, the order of these things shouldn't matter, right? Like if you're uh, the, the 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 difference between this cat and this cat shouldn't matter. Like it matters in some some settings. Like let's say KL divergence is not a symmetrical function, but in this case, I believe it will uh, come out to be symmetrical because cosine similarity in of itself is symmetrical. So the, the it'll work out because so if cosine similarity is symmetrical, that means the sum of cosine sim similarities will be symmetrical, and it's all goodness from there. So once you have these. Uh, you know, you have these intermediate representations that you've built for yourself. Well, you can use them to, to fine tune on some sort of classification or a detection problem. And so here, they, this is a paper, this is a figure from the paper directly. Uh, and you'll see here that, well, first off, the accuracy is a lot higher relative to the same number of parameters for a bunch of other models. So they definitely did their homework here in terms of benchmarking a bunch of other uh, CV models. To be honest, I haven't heard of most of them. Uh, but I'm assuming a lot of them are other contrastive methods. Um, let's just see, like, let's see, big uh, CPC V2, oh, what is this, for example? Oh, yeah, it does look like they're all contra contrastive methods. Interesting. Okay. And great. And so then they, they end off with saying, like, you know, this looks promising and stuff. There's also this, uh, I, I like this visualization here by... Uh, like by some folks at Google, it sort of shows you uh, at a high level how these represent, like how one, you know, you have these images, you're going to create a bunch of augmentations of it. Right? So here, for example, you're zooming in on the head, then you're grayscaling. Here, you're zooming in on the legs, and then you're you're reddening, and you're, you're changing the saturation of the image. Uh, once you do that, you pass it to an encoder, it gives you a representation, you pass this representation to an MLP. And then this MLP is going to compare to all other, all other permutations of all the images in the batches are going to be pairwise compared to each other. And then the network is going to basically be told, okay, great, you should ad adapt the weights in the, in the following way. Um, so, yeah, so here, like, like yeah, so, the, so generally when people think about stuff like unsupervised learning, well, there, there's other famous examples, right? Like autoencoders I talked about where you have the layers get larger to thinner and then back to larger. 
and you, you're constructing the input. So that's what your supervision signal is. Or in the case of generative adversarial nets, it's sort of like a similar idea where you're trying to figure out, it's a similar idea to contrastive learning and in that instead of trying to figure out if two things are real or not, you're trying to figure out if something fake or not. Uh, so it's a similar uh, idea. All right, and so here with the with the SimClear formulation, what they're doing is they're gonna, you know, they're saying we're gonna maximize the agreement of representations under data transformation using a contrast of loss in the latent feature space. So latent feature space is just like fancy words uh, to say, uh, where is it? Actually, it was better here. So really when we say latent feature space, like it's just a fancy word for this. Like basically the, the values uh, in, in a given layer, like the, the last one before the projection head where you're doing the dense computations, because here it's all CNNs. That's how the, this encoder and this projection head really changed. Like here there's CNNs with ReLUs and here there's dense layers with ReLU. Like that's about it. Um, right, so here, like, as you can see, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, well, we're gonna do some data transformation. Like this is what the, so a transformation belonging to the set of all possible transformations T. We're going to have a representation that we're going to learn via something called a, like via a ResNet, but it could be other networks. And then we're going to see how we can maximize the agreement between these two representations by taking the pairwise softmax of all the similarity scores, right? Um, so here in this case, they use a fairly simple network. They use a two-layer, uh, like a, a two-layer nonlinear uh, MLP. But it could be really anything here as well. Like, uh, there's no reason why uh, you know deeper networks or more shallow networks could work just fine. Two is just basically interesting because it's just a uh, it's the smallest nonlinear one, right? So that's probably why they ended up using it. So if you look at the pseudocode again, it looks scary, but it's also very similar, right? It's like one you're taking you're doing some sort of data augmentation. The weird indices is because like we're do, we're working over pairs of batches, right? We're not working, so that's why the, that's where the two comes in, uh, because we're working over pairs of batches. You have some sort of representation that you learn, and then uh, an augmentation. And so similarly here, you do this for the second image. So then for all images in the for all images in the batch, take the SI, so the pairwise similarity. And then you define your loss as minus sij plus log of identity function of exponential sik. And then, okay, let's take a closer look at this. So then the loss is 1 over 2 to the n. 2 to the n, right, because there's 2n batches that were created. But if you're doing more data, like there's no reason why this can't be 3 or 4. Like this could be, you know, like more pairwise. It becomes more complicated. But in principle, the same idea applies. Uh, right, so we're, we're, so here when they say uh, the loss of 2k minus uh, 2k, so here th they're using k as a way to reference elements among the pairs, right? So, right, yeah, so because k is going from 1 to n, and then, yeah, so k from 1 to n. And so here, yeah, so basically they're saying like we're going to compare images uh, pairwise and before and after in the batch, and then we're going to update the network such that uh, F and G, such that we min minimize L, right? So what's F and G? Do they, yeah, so F is the is the network that gives you the representation, and G is the network that gives you the projection. And this is, again, just fancy words, like the representation is really just saying F is the CNNs and G is the dense layer, like that, that's it. So one interesting thing here is like they, they trained it over fairly large batches uh, with like 256 to 8,000 and they're saying we don't use a memory bank. So what a memory bank is, is you can think of it like a key value store uh, where you store important images. So let's say images that were useful to you. And so it simplifies the problem. But on the, on the other hand, given that neural networks essentially do a form of data compression, it's interesting to just like not use this. Uh, so for so for to stabilize training for large batch sizes, we use a lot the Lars optimizer. I forget how Lars works, but it's a popular optimizer. Oh, so scale learning dynamically according to the gradient norm. Uh, sure. So so if the to avoid shortcut, we use global batch norm computes batch norm statistics over all cores. Sure. So so here again, like look, where you're doing an update over batches. Uh, and so you just want to basically, nor like in, in general, like normalization is just a way to stabilize training. Otherwise, what happens is certain batches will have very high activations. Uh, and so similarly here, they're, they're saying we want to also scale the learning rate according to the gradient norm. And really, both of these ideas are to uh, make the training a bit more stable. 
So the data says they use our ImageNet, but they say it works over Cypher and MNIST, and I guess they didn't try it out because these are just nets smaller. And then they use, okay, they we use a linear classifier and learn features, and then we do transfer learning by fine tuning on other data sets. So transfer learning really means you take the first, uh, so, so you take this, the intermediate representation H, right? And then you use that to, uh, and then you add maybe another linear, non-linear MLP after it. You fix the first part so you don't retrain it. And then the second part is like you, you continue training. And this is just like a way to end up using image classifiers as if they were embeddings the same way you would uh, NLP. Yeah, so here they talk about like a, bu a bunch of data augmentation techniques. So global and local views, this is like a, a way of cropping. Like, so they discuss several cropping techniques. Uh, you know, so here there's all sorts of stuff, but basically think of it like if you were to open up something like Photoshop, basically anything you can see there could be used as a data augmentation technique and, and work uh, just fine. Without color, okay. And it needs stronger color data augmentation than supervised learning. Beats augmented, should we think data augmentation for self-supervised learning? Interesting. So unsupervised contrastive learning benefits more from bigger models. All right, so if we're at 500 million parameters, then so supervised R5, so yeah, so this is supervised resonance RT. Is that what this is saying? Models and red stars are our strength for a thousand epochs. Okay, sure. Uh, supervised. Interesting. Yeah, I can't really read this to be honest. Like, I think I'll go back to the paper. I'm not really sure what these labels mean here. Okay, so they also say that when it came to the projection head, they tried a bunch of techniques like identity map, which means you do nothing, a linear projection, which is you basically just have a layer, and then a nonlinear projection, which is you have a layer and then, then something like a relu or a 10h after it. And they found that the nonlinearity helps. That's just because like nonlinear problems can express a wider range of numbers than a, than a linear one. So that's sort of no surprise. Uh, we measure information in H and Z. H, okay, loss function, batch size. Well, two normalization, contrast. It's not correlated linear evaluation when all two norm and temperature are changed. Okay. So then with larger batch sizes, what happens? Like, what's the biggest one? Like this beige thing. It's like a batch size of 8,000. And with a batch size of 8,000 for 1,000 epochs, in general, it seems like larger batch sizes are better, but there's only diminishing returns. It really feels like most of the returns are obtained with like, I mean, yeah, like they're better, but I don't know. It's like what 2% difference at this from 65 to 67%. Really training epochs has a much bigger impact on, but they're not like, yeah, I mean, this is given from 100 to 1000. I'm almost curious like, if I were to train this from, a thousand to eight thousand, like sort of figure out like what's the trade-off, right? Like, would I rather just increase the batch size or increase the, the running time? All right. So they compare this a, a bunch, a bunch of, against a bunch of other baselines over previous soda, fully supervised ResNet, self-supervised learning. Okay. Uh, they also fine-tune it on a couple of data sets, and what happens? Fine-tuned. So this is their technique, self-supervised. Oh, interesting. I'm just shocked though, like random initialization does like a pretty good job for these image data sets. Like random initialization for Cypher 10. So all of these are particularly meaningful. Let's look at the places where it thanks for it. So let's say Sun 397 or Cypher 100 DTD. I mean, yeah, it does increase substantially and it looks like it's sort of neck to neck against uh, supervised at any point in time, but that's sort of surprising, right? Like the fact that, well, it's not, right? Because you are fine tuning it with supervised signal. And I, I guess really that the point here would be, would, would you expect contrastive learning to make the performance worse than training from scratch? And it seems like no, right? And then given that you've trained in a self-supervised way with SimClear, 
once, then multiple people can get those performance gains for various downstream models. Uh, and so it is like, it looks like just generally like a, a good deal to do it. And it's only for a couple of data sets where it, it seems like uh, would share a portion of labels with ImageNet. Okay. Okay, so they're saying really it's a combination of design choices that they made, and it's a simple yet effective self-supervised learning framework advancing state-of-the-art by a large margin. All right, that's great. So let's go over the paper now. Uh, here's a design pretext. Which we call SimClear. Yeah, so again, like it's back, back to this main idea here. Like we said F this is the CNN, G is the DNN, and then T is the data transform. So these ideas in of themselves can will solve this problem. So here, like specifically, they'll use a, a ResNet. Here, they'll just use a regular like linear activation layer with a, with a non-linearity. So for example, what this looks like is if your input is WH, Right, and then your output is also going to be like the sigmoid of that times, sorry, the relu of that times uh, the w again. So this is the contrast of loss as well, and then this is the what, what I forget what they call this thing, the loss. Um, yeah, look, so this is the similarity, right? So they're taking the similarity between two points and then dividing that by the similarity over all all all, all possible pairs. Uh, oh yeah, so they call it the normalized temperature scaled cross entropy loss. So the, the temperature here is basically this T. So one normalized temperature scale, entr cross entropy loss. Cross entropy loss because the cross entropy loss is what you use for if you have multiple classes that you're trying to predict. Uh, in this case, you're trying, to, you're trying to figure out which of the specific images in this batch is the most similar to you. Uh, you can think of that problem as being trying to predict one class out of a, out of a bunch of them, like out of a bunch of pairs. And then it's normalized by the temperature because this temperature sort of uh, it sort of lets you influence how sensitive uh, you are to things being close or not. So it's like a useful hyperparameter, but you don't need it. Like I've, I've honestly never used temperatures before, uh, but they're useful. I've, I've seen them used quite a bit. This part we saw already. Like this, uh, this this part of the this part of the paper was in the in the slide. These were the the way they they do the data preprocessing. They do talk about why. Uh, large batch sizes are good and having a global batch normalization uh, to make sure that the training is uh, stable. Let me just quickly show you the, the Lars optimizer since it is, uh, it is popular. Right, so yeah, so yeah, I think yeah, the, the name is good. So layer-wise adaptive rate scaling. So it's a learning rate where you have a separate learning rate for each layer and not for each weight. And the magnitude of the update is controlled with respect to the weight norm for better control of training speed. Um, so you can imagine for deep models, like let's say you may want to be in a scenario where you want like later in training the deeper parts of the network to train more quickly, but you want the earlier ones to sort of ossify so you can stabilize the training. Just because if you imagine like, let's say you have a hundred layer network and you change the first layer completely, your output's gonna change like drastically. But if you change the last layer, like yeah, your output is gonna change if you make a small change, but you're not gonna get it in the situation where there's a butterfly effect that changes things completely drastically. All right. Okay, so here they talk about like composing like a bunch of pre-processing techniques. They talk about the various architectures that they use and the various losses. So you see here, for example, it's interesting they use like they use a triplet, uh, but it could be like a quadruplet or a pentuplet or or whatever. Like this is sort of the main idea is this framework is general. Like it's just a question of how you would define the loss function and having an encoder for each. But it's really just a couple of lines of code change, and then you can develop uh, something that looks like this. So this is just in general true. It's like an important point, like a nonlinear projection head improves representation quality of the layer before it. So generally, uh, that's why like you generally end with dead layers with some sort of nonlinear projection. Uh, they just like work better. 
So loss functions and batch sizes is all good. Yeah, so we saw this paper as well. And then, yeah, so the conclusion we already saw. So I think they did a pretty good job actually with the, with the slide. So here they talk about like some of the pre-processing techniques they actually use. So this is the appendix. So they talk about the crop. They talk about like the color distortion here, for example. Uh, so these are all like fairly sim sim simple, like check this out, right? So one, it's like you're basically going to apply them as if like you're doing operations sequentially. So given an image X, like one, like change the brightness, two, change the contrast, three, change the saturation, four, change the U. And you notice here it's always X, 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 right? And then you return X. Uh, so a lot of these pre-processing techniques are look very similar. Uh, and I actually really like the way fast AI does it. Fast AI, they have a data structure called the pipeline. Uh, but the way you can think of it is that like, imagine if all of these were elements of a list like this and this and this and this and this. And then you would say for uh, like basically transform uh, and transforms uh, X equals transform X. Right, and then you return X. So this is sort of the, the, the pattern, but this is also very simple, right? Like you, it just, this will just be more code. The idea is that like, well, if, if, if someone wants to give you like, look, do all these things in sequence, like uh, putting them in the list is sort of like a reasonable uh, heuristic to follow. So they talk also here quite a bit about their, their batch sizes and uh, it does seem that larger batch up to 30K, wow, these are really large batches. Uh, while training longer can still significantly improve the performance. I mean, yeah, that's sort of what we observed here. It seems like, oh yeah, interesting. Yeah, they, they did actually increase the perform training here more than we thought they would hear. So here they got to about 87. Uh, and then here, oh, this top five, top one, right? Okay. Interesting. Broader composition of data augmentation further improves performance. Uh, yeah, you can sort of expect this as like to be a, a good technique for regularization, right? Just in general, the more aggressive your pre-processing is and uh, the more data you're actually constructing for yourself, so the better you would expect the, the perf to get. I'm going to remove this. Oh, interesting. So here, for example, they're actually looking at the projections of images from 10 classes. And then you notice that there is what, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Yeah, so it actually also yielded 10 classes. So this sort of tells us that our clusters are good. Right? That said, the one thing about clustering is that like, let's say it may not cluster along the dimensions that you find meaningful. Like let's say you're clustering email by whether you think it's spam or not, maybe it'll cluster it by like whether it's written in Europe or in the US, for example. So like clustering is is not uh, generally sort of needs like I guess like some self supervision to be a bit more helpful. So I haven't personally used clustering a lot for many useful stuff. Uh, so here they talk about transfer learning. So remember, this is the idea of like you know once we have these sim clear embeddings, like we can use them for some sort of form of downstream task, whether. You know, we add, just add a linear classifier, whether we fine tune, whether we train from scratch and looking at the baselines. So there's, when you say transfer learning, there's multiple ways of doing it, but these are all reasonable. Like again, one way is to freeze the weights and other is to use them as a starting point to initialize the weights. Um, all are reasonable. I'm not sure what's the, what's the best one. So great. So, so now that we've covered the, the paper and the slides and sort of the high level idea, I thought it would be helpful to show you how the code is actually implemented in something like PyTorch Lightning. Uh, so PyTorch Lightning is sort of like a simple version of, of PyTorch, uh, sort of like a KRS-like aspect to it. So let me just show you this part of the code and then we can sort of form our own opinions about it. So you'll notice here, okay, well, we have like this tensor and then, okay, so this is some stuff we think for, okay, for syncing. So some stuff for distributed computation. Remember the projection. So this is the dense neural network that gives you, uh, that like it's going to build a representation where you're going to try to maximize the similarity. And remember, it was just a bunch of linear layers. And so here you can see it's a linear layer. And then it, the, in, the linear layer has an input dimensionality and hidden dimension. And then we're going to put in a batch norm here in the middle, then a relu, and then we're going to have another linear layer with then with nothing after it. And then the model itself actually just 
uh, takes this model and then does this f dot normalize part. So where does normalize come from here? So yeah, so you notice for example a couple of things here. They're using like Lars. They're using like some pre-built models, like specifically ResNet 18 and 50. Uh, otherwise, anything else looks surprising here. Just they're using some normalization that seems specific to data sets. So let's just like take a closer look at how this works. So this is the projection part. And then this is SimClear itself. And so it takes in like a number of devices, hidden NMLP, max epochs. This is the temperature parameter. Uh, I guess it's something as to whether it has a convolution or not at the very first layer, a max pool, optimizer, LARS. All of these are very typical. So we just put them all as inputs to potentially change how this thing works. So let's take a look at, so say, okay, we're going to do this projection. And then it has a linear layer. Okay, so yeah, so notice here the forward pass uh, just l literally returns the the last, like basically the last output of ResNet. So here, like if you look at the encoder, okay, it says self dot init model. Okay, that's great. And then okay, this seems like it. So where is ResNet coming in? So this projection, I, I guess we talked about already. Uh, so here, for example, you see this is the, this is the cosine similarity here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So init model. So it's going to call self dot init model, and then init model is uh, you basically also pass it in uh, an argument called the architecture, either ResNet eighteen or fifty, and that determines what the encoder is. So this is just going to do this, right? Uh, and then here, the shared step is this. Like this is sort of like look at this, right? So this is the you get two images, you get the representation. You get the projection for both, and then your loss is this scaled uh, cross scaled temperature cross entropy loss between those two projections with a given temperature. So so far you can see here like the the code. Uh, let me zoom in a bit. Okay, I'm gonna discuss this again because it was very zoomed out. So. Like I said before, we have this projection layer and the only thing this projection layer is doing is it has a linear layer with a batch norm and then a ReLU and then another linear layer. And then this is just does a forward pass. Like this is this is what the, the projection step is. However, if you actually look at this, this part of the model, like the, the actual SimClear module, what it's doing is one, it's initializing an encoder. And so if you look at this init function here, it's just basically saying, okay, look, give me the output of the last layer of ResNet. And then either this could be ResNet 18 or 50, depending on what kinds of arguments you pass this thing. Uh, and then if you if you keep going here, this, uh, this shared step, this looks like exactly like the pseudocode we took a look at. So one, we're gonna look at uh, images from a batch. We're gonna get the representation of each of all of the images in the batch. We're going to get projections for all of the images in the batch. And then we're going to pairwise compare with the normalized temperature scaled cross entropy with this temperature here. Uh, and so really the loss here is just like basically now that we have the loss, like basically minimizing this will end up giving you the, the, the parameters that you want. And so if you look at this thing here, uh, you're just doing the self dot share. The training step is you're saying, well, I want the loss to be the self dot shared step. And then I want to return the loss. All right, and that's pretty much it. The other stuff here seems to be more about like, let's say weight decay, the different kinds of optimizers that you could use. You want to use SGD, do you want to use Adam? Do you want to use Lars? Lars is is a, is basically like layer wise adaptive and this is useful for larger networks because uh, a network is very sensitive to the way the first few layers are changed a lot more than the last few layers. Uh, and so here, for example, like you, you have like an implementation of this loss uh, what's interesting about it is like they have a distributed implementation of this. So this is something I'd suggest you can take a look at. Maybe I'll have a separate tutorial about this, about like the all reduce and all gather uh, patterns here. But at a high level, like we're basically going to take the, like we're basically going to take this output where we're going to concatenate our two outputs. Uh, and then what we're going to do is, yeah, so then we're saying, okay, given these two concatenated outputs, we're going to take the, this is this is the matrix multiplication, then we take the exponential, uh, and then we take the sum of them, and then at some point we should be able to see the cosine similarity at some point. Uh, numerical stability. 
Oh, interesting. So they have like some clamping. In general, like this is a very common trend when you look at a lot of machine learning code is that like you want to just make sure that values don't get too big or too small. That's where clamping really comes in. Uh, and otherwise, this is sort of like just uh, like I guess like a more like, like this is just like the, the way the function looks like, right? I pause like there's not going to be the cosine similarity here because this is just really a soft max operation. Uh, but this is sort of how this works. And so otherwise, if you just like look at the model specific args, really nothing too surprising. Like does it, what kind of floats does it use? Like what's the size of the hidden layers? Uh, what kind of transforms should you use and how strong should they be? Uh, these should be as diverse as possible. Well, how many epochs should there be? Number of nodes. Uh, and then otherwise, like I said, this looks very similar to any other uh, machine learning problem that we've talked about. So really, I think if, if you get one, if you take one thing away, it's probably just I want you to remember this picture because I think it's the most important idea. Uh, is that essentially when you're doing contrastive learning, you take an image and then you make a bunch of variations of it. And then you compare those variations in a pairwise manner, compress those uh, variations into fixed sized vectors, uh, and then use those vectors for downstream tasks. And then specifically uh, also put a non-linear layer on top of this intermediate representation where you're gonna try to maximize the similarity between images that are actually similar. Uh, and th again, this is an example of a self-supervised technique that doesn't need labeled data, but you can use this and then fine tune it uh, on, a, on, on a task uh, that's like, let's say an image classification task or an image regression task instead of training uh, from scratch. So this is a very useful technique. It's very popular. Uh, I'm personally very excited about specifically for applications in online learning. Like I think this can is potentially like a good solution to sort of learn what's important about a new image very quickly. And so maybe that's like something I guess I'll talk about a bit more. And if you're interested in online learning, I have a whole separate video just about that. And again, everyone, I really hope you enjoyed this. I certainly did. And I'll see you all soon. Thank you.